Today on The In Between, we are going to widen our creepiness circle and talk about some ghost stories. The stories that we have today feature things that kids have experienced that I, as an adult, never want to experience. A few years ago, Angie lived in a two-bedroom apartment with her two sons, Riley, who was eight, and Tanner, who was ten. She got one room, so the boys shared the other room with a bunk bed, and they always used to fight over who got the top bunk. Riley usually won. One night, Angie's putting her boys to bed, and she's reading them some stories, and she sees that they're falling asleep. So she gives them each a kiss on the head, and she quietly slips out of their room and goes to her room right next door and goes to bed. About an hour later, Riley screams bloody murder, and Angie jumps out of her bed, runs to the boys' room, thinking Riley must have fallen off the top bunk. Sure enough, he is on the ground, head down, still screaming. And she tries to calm him down, asks if he's okay, thinking, I guess this is going to be a trip to the ER tonight. And he just looks at her and screams, get me out of here. So she picks him up and carries him across the hall to the bathroom, where she turns on the lights and starts checking him for injuries. Long story short, Riley is fine. Turns out he actually jumped from the top bunk and landed just fine. So Angie asks him, Why did you do that? And he blurts out to get away from the lady on the ceiling with the backwards head. Now, by this point, Tanner's woken up and he's so annoyed with Riley. And he's like, dude, it's fine. You're okay. There's nothing to be afraid of. So Angie finally manages to calm Riley down. But from that night forward, Riley refuses to sleep in his own bed and insists on sleeping with Angie in hers, which she was okay with. But she did try to convince him to go back to his own bed. Tanner even offered to give him the bottom bunk permanently. Riley wouldn't budge. So about a month goes by and Tanner's still sleeping on the top bunk in the boys' room. And one night he wakes everybody up by jumping off the top bunk, running into Angie's room and climbing into bed with Angie and Riley. And Angie says, honey, what's up? But Tanner refuses to talk about it. Now, he had just spent some time with his slightly older cousin that day. So Angie's thinking, well, maybe the boys watch some movies that they shouldn't have been watching. And Tanner's just had a nightmare. So she kind of pats him on the back, rubs his back a little bit, says, it's all right. It's all right. You're safe. Don't worry about it. And they all go back to sleep. So now all three of them are sleeping in Angie's bed every night. And she does her best to get them to go back to their beds. She even buys them cool tents that go over the top and flashlights and comics. And the boys love this stuff and they'll hang out in their room and enjoy it, but only during the day. And both the boys love animals. So she even goes so far as to buy them two mice with a big cage, thinking that if there's some other living creature in the room, that would give him some sense of comfort. But even that didn't work. And one day Tanner finally tells Angie that he saw a shadow moving on the ceiling that he thought was a woman with long black hair. He said he was woken up by a flashing white light, and he thought it was Riley turning his flashlight on and off and on again. But when he looked closer, it was coming from the closet. And then he looked up and he saw the woman on the ceiling, and he just noped it out of there. Now Angie's like, great, I have two kids who are afraid of a monster in the closet. And she talked to her ex and to some other parents, and they all tried to reassure the boys that it's okay that there's no such thing as monsters. And she and her ex were actually almost to the point of taking the boys to see a therapist because they thought, well, maybe there's some other psychological issue going on. So a few nights later, it's like three o'clock on a Saturday morning and everybody's asleep in Angie's bed. Tanner's in the middle. Riley's on the far side next to the window, and Angie's on the side that's closest to the door. Now, normally the door would be closed, but this particular night it was open because they had all just had an epic Nerf gun fight before bed. It was awesome. So Angie's in bed snoring away when she suddenly wakes up. So she opens her eyes, and as she's trying to focus, she sees a white flashing light reflecting on the wall outside of her room. 
And she thinks it must be one of the boys' flashlights losing its batteries or something. And she debates on whether she actually wants to get out of bed to go turn it off or whether she should just roll over and ignore it. When she sees the source of the light is slowly moving down the hallway, getting closer to her room. Well, she immediately thinks there's an intruder. So she very quietly gets out of bed, gets closer to the door so she can maybe kind of see if she can see what's going on out there or hear anything. And she peeks out into the hallway and she sees that the light is flashing near the ground coming from the boys' room. And she doesn't hear anything. No footsteps, nothing. So she quietly tiptoes out into the hallway and looks into the boys' room and the light stops. And she starts freaking out. So she flips on the light switch and nothing. Mice are chilling, nothing out of place. And she looks all over the floor for the source of the light and finds nothing. Well, they ended up moving out a couple of months later and into a place where each of the boys got their own room. And the boys were not afraid to be in their own rooms anymore. And Tanner is now... 15 years old. So a couple of months ago, Angie told him the story of her getting up at night to look for the light. And Tanner turns white as a ghost and just looks at her. And Angie's like, Tanner, what's the matter? And Tanner looks her dead in the eye and says, you're lucky you didn't look up. Starting from about age five, Rebecca has always been afraid of her room, especially the fireplace in the corner. It had a grate on it that was painted black, which seemed to kind of disappear when the lights went out. And in the dark, she would always see people coming out of the opening of the fireplace. And they never looked at her, but she's pretty sure they knew she was there. And one figure always came slinking out of that fireplace, a young woman. However, Rebecca's family was always skeptical of anything even close to paranormal. So they just thought it was her being a kid with an overactive imagination and that she would just grow out of it and the dreams would go away. Eventually, she became so terrified of going to sleep in that room that she would fight her parents kicking and screaming, saying, I don't want to go to sleep in there. And she would just fight them. And every night became this epic battle between her and her parents trying to get her to go to sleep in this room. And she finally convinced them to at least paint that metal grate on the fireplace white so that when the lights go out, she could at least kind of see that. But she continues to be terrified of that room. And despite therapy and medication, by the time she's 14, she starts sleeping on the floor because the nightmares won't go away. And she was even diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder at age 12 because she kept hallucinating the same woman. Red hair, petite, lots of makeup, dark eyeshadow, and bruises all over her face. Her face was beaten so badly that you almost couldn't see her eyes. And last week, Rebecca's mom finally told her something that she'd been avoiding telling her for years. Rebecca and her family lived in a New York City apartment, so their neighbor was just on the other side of the wall. Now, the neighbor was a nice little old lady who was about 70 years old who had lived in her apartment long before Rebecca and her family moved in. And when Rebecca was a kid, the fighting over bedtime got so bad and the screaming got so loud that the neighbor heard it. And she was worried because of previous events that had happened in that apartment. Apparently, a drug dealer lived in that apartment before Rebecca and her family had moved in, and he had committed a murder in that apartment in Rebecca's room. He beat a woman to death and stuffed her in the fireplace. Lisa, her brother Jake, and their parents rented a house for a while when she was a kid. It had an attic that ran the length of the house, and the access to the attic was on one side of the house in her brother's closet. And then her parents' room was in the middle, and Lisa's room was on the other side. Now, their parents 
forbid them to play in the attic because it was full of boxes of stuff left over from former tenants. Their landlord said, you can go through them if you want, but I don't know what's in them, so do so at your own risk. So Lisa's parents had just put some of their boxes up there. They put some mattresses and things up there and just told the kids just stay out of the attic. But on the few occasions that Lisa had been up there with her parents, she noticed that in the far end of the attic above her room was a little locked room. But they had had plenty of space in the attic for all of their stuff. So nobody ever bothered to see what was in that room. Well, Lisa starts getting woken up every night by sounds of something moving around up there, which always ended in creaking noises almost right above her. And she thinks it has to be Jake because the attic access is in his room. But she figures at some point, if he's up there messing around, he's also messing around on top of her parents' room and they're going to hear him and he's going to get busted. So she just does her best to ignore the noises and go back to sleep. And on one summer weekend day, Lisa sleeps in. And when she wakes up, she looks outside and she sees her parents working on the garden that they had put in. And so she gets some breakfast and she goes back up into her room to eat her breakfast and play on her Game Boy for a while. And for the first time in months of being woken up every night by the sounds and the creaking coming from the attic... She hears it during the day. Anxious to get Jake caught and busted, she sneaks over into Jake's room. And the closet door is open and the attic access is open. So she quietly climbs up the steps into the attic just enough so she can peek and see what's going on. And she sees that all of the boxes have been moved to clear a path. And that the door of the little room on the other end above her room, that door is open. Jake sticks his head out, sees her, and calls her over and says, Come on, you gotta see this. And then disappears back into the room again. Now Lisa says the only time she has ever felt so instantly, totally, instinctually afraid was the first time she heard a cougar scream in the woods at night. And she immediately scrambles down the ladder, out of Jake's room, downstairs, outside, and she's going to tell on her brother. But when she gets outside, she sees Jake is there helping her parents in the garden. And apparently, he's been there all morning and afternoon. And when her parents ask her, honey, why do you look so scared? Well, still being in shock and and afraid they're not going to believe her, she just says, I think there's somebody in the attic. And her parents said, honey, what do you mean? So she tells them, I heard footsteps. And when I went to look, the attic door is open. Now Lisa's dad, he starts cussing and goes to his truck to get his gun. And he comes back and tells the family, if I'm not back out in 15 minutes, I want you guys to get in the truck, drive to the neighbors and call the police. So Lisa's dad goes in the house. And after a few very anxious moments, comes back out pissed as hell and demanding the kids tell him which one of them has been messing around in the attic. Well, both kids say, wasn't me. And so they all, as a family unit, go in the house to check it out. And they all go up in the attic and they see that, yes, all of the boxes have been moved aside. And yes, that door to that little back room is still open. And all that's inside that room, there's no light There's no window. All that's in there is a rocking chair that's covered in decades of dust with no signs that anyone has been anywhere near it. And Jake says, see, there's proof. If I'd been up in the attic, I would have left footprints and stuff. But in the absence of any other explanation, their dad doesn't buy it. And Jake gets grounded for a couple of weeks for sneaking around and breaking the rules. Now, Lisa still refused to sleep in that room. And she'd sleep downstairs on the couch if she could get away with it. Because the sound of footsteps and the creaking of the rocking chair would still wake her up every night. One of Tom's friends, Dan, lived next to a vacant house. It would sell and people would move in and then shortly thereafter they would leave and the house would go up for sale again. 
Now, one summer, when the last family had moved out and the house was listed again, the boys decided to grab some fast food and go take a tour of the house. They figured it had to be haunted because why else would people not stay there very long? And in what Tom describes as a demonstration of poor judgment, he thought it would be a good idea to play chicken with whatever was haunting that house. Now, Dan, he's pretty skinny and the back door has a dog door. So Dan goes down, shimmies his way through the dog door, and then on the inside unlocks the door and opens it so Tom can come in. Now the boys go and explore all of the rooms and they figure out it's really not that special. It's just a 50s bungalow with built-ins and nice woodwork, and it actually looks a lot like Dan's house. And after they decide that the house really isn't creepy at all, they sit down on the dining room floor across from a little horseshoe nook that has a table and a little bench seat. And at this point, it's starting to get dark outside, but the house doesn't have any curtains, so they still have enough light coming in. They've been there maybe 25 minutes. And after they eat their food, they decide to just sit for a little bit and let those burgers and fries digest for a while. Now, Tom is telling Dan about this new game that he bought. When mid-sentence, out of nowhere, his vision goes black and he feels this eerie coldness wash over his body. It's a feeling so thick that it feels like it's penetrating everywhere, going all the way down to his bones. And while he's trying to wrap his head around what is happening, he hears Dan scream. Tom can't see anything, and he's just groping around, trying to find something while this cold and unease is still hanging with him. And after what feels like hours, Tom feels Dan take his hand and help him get up off the floor. And Dan pulls him by the arm, leads him through the house, out the back door. And as soon as he gets outside, Tom feels a shiver go through his entire body, starting at his toes, working its way all the way up to his head, and suddenly he can see again. So there's both the boys standing there in the backyard. Dan is as white as a sheet and just terrified. And Tom just kind of feels a little bit off and kind of gross, for lack of a better term, and still a little bit in shock. And he tells Dan he couldn't see anything until he got back outside. It was this utter darkness that enveloped him. And Dan is just standing there staring at him. So Tom finally asks him, why did you scream? Dan just gives him a big hug and says, I pulled you out of the house as soon as you said you went blind, because a little girl who was completely black, but still see-through, crawled out from underneath that table and sat on you. And if you're looking for still more creepy, this video right here should top your creepy meter. And we'll see you again on the in-between.